tonight, the people have spoken. I wasn't even originally planning to run for mayor of sustainability, but after I saw the other guy release his platform of fewer trees, more plastic straws, I had no choice but to step in. I did it for the sea turtles, and I did it for you. And now here we are, celebrating this victory, surrounded by plant-based cocktail wieners and wild Maine blueberry cupcakes, compostable dishware, and not a balloon in sight which are just as bad for wildlife as plastic straws. And I have to admit, I have a little bit of a problem. See, like many politicians, I made some bold claims throughout my campaign. I promised you expansive new hiking trails, a public community garden in every neighborhood, and double the number of local food banks, all without making you, the people, feel financially burdened or displaced. And those promises were really easy to make at the time, but now I've gotta figure out how to keep them. Hi, I'm Mayor Miriam Nielsen, and this is Study Hall Sustainability. The first step in keeping all my campaign promises is getting the people of Sustainability on board. And well, they all live in Sustainability, the city named after sustainability, and a lot of them voted for me, so it's not like that's an insurmountable challenge. The challenging part is that a lot of people who care about sustainability and climate change also worry about those things. And I get it, we've seen a lot of scary stuff. Superstorms washing houses out to sea, wildfires ravaging whole communities, and entire regions without access to clean water. Climate change is a very real threat, and it makes sense to be worried about it. In fact, we should be worried about it. Around 64% of people in the US report worrying about the climate, and that worry can be helpful. However, it can also be debilitating. About 9% of the people in the US say they can't stop worrying about climate change, and 7% say that it's affecting their ability to do and enjoy things. And when that's the case, helpful worry can turn into climate anxiety. That means people experience anxiety symptoms like intrusive thoughts, increased heart rate, and negative effects on their day-to-day -day functioning because they're stressed about climate change. People who have experienced a severe weather event magnified or made more likely by climate change, like a flood, wildfire, or superstorm may also experience anxiety as a trauma response to what they already know climate change is capable of. And countries with fewer resources bear the brunt of the effects of climate change. People who live in these countries report even more climate worry and anxiety than those in the US. That anxiety can be crippling and lead to hopelessness about the future. So my job as mayor of sustainability is to ease some of that climate anxiety amongst my constituents. And there are ways to cope, like by talking with others about what you're experiencing and focusing on media that informs you and inspires you to act, but doesn't leave you spiraling into a hole of climate doom. It can also help to imagine what the future could look like, what we want it to look like. See, by picturing and working toward a more sustainable future, those scary visions of the climate apocalypse may begin to ease their grip, and the future may begin to look a little less scary. But the future is complex. There's so much uncertainty. And unfortunately, there's no horoscope or tarot deck I can consult when it comes to the fate of our planet. At least not while keeping my academic and scientific reputation. So to ease the climate anxiety and help sustainability plan our most sustainable future, we'll actually have to think about a bunch of different futures. One way to do this is with a futures cone, a model that helps illustrate all the possible futures we face and sort them into just how likely they might be. A futures cone can be a useful tool for imagining all kinds of futures. Like there's nothing to stop me from using it to picture a future where I finally crocheted all 24 dog sweaters and I never have to pick up a crochet hook or a skein of yarn again. But it works great for helping us work through our potential sustainability futures too. See, the small end of the futures cone represents today, our current environmental reality, climate anxiety, and all. As we move forward to the future, the cone gets bigger and bigger, representing how many different possibilities there are for our future. And while all those possibilities might be even more anxiety-inducing for some, it's not all Mad Max or bust. We have options here. We can sort these different futures into categories that fit into each other like rushing nesting dolls of possibility. The possible futures represent this biggest area of the cone because like my second grade teacher used to remind me, anything is possible. Like I could fall asleep tonight, dream up a way to generate renewable energy for free, change everything about the future of climate change, and go down in history as a sustainability hero and the most beloved mayor of sustainability ever. But unfortunately for my political career, just because something's possible doesn't mean it's realistic. Those futures, known as the plausible, make up the second widest area of the cone. They're all the possible futures with the most wild card scenarios ruled out. So no most beloved mayor award in my future, I guess. Then there's the probable, things that are likely to happen. For instance, it's probable that I'm gonna eat 60 pounds of blueberries this summer and that Hollywood is gonna keep making movies about the multiverse. It's also probable that nations will continue to pursue renewable energy sources as a way of reducing emissions and generating clean, cheap energy. The final potential future is the preferable. It sits right on the border between the possible and plausible and includes all those futures we want to happen. The preferable future may include some possible but unlikely outcomes, but also those preferable futures that are more likely. Like a brilliant, effortless solution coming to me in my sleep and solving all our climate problems, but also me working really, really hard to implement sustainable solutions in sustainability. And when we're working toward a sustainable future, that's where we want to spend most of our time. We can picture the ideal future and then work backward to plan for and achieve that vision. And while a good plan can be really helpful for dealing with anxiety, unfortunately, no amount of planning can guarantee my brilliant climate-saving sleep vision. 
The futures cone is a great way to help understand the vastness of things to come, but it doesn't actually give us a whole lot of pointers for how to land in that ideal preferable futures section. You know, rather than getting bogged down in a possible dystopian nightmare future dominated by Elon Musk and his super army of AI-powered Cybertrucks. As mayor of sustainability, my job isn't just to picture the future I want and make a bunch of empty promises about it. It's to actually take steps to make that future a reality so my constituents can sleep a little sounder without those Cybertruck nightmares. And for those who hate cones as much as a dog after surgery, good news. These other strategies don't involve geometric shapes at all. One great tool to use for fulfilling my campaign promises and actually creating the future I want to achieve is a community vision project, which is like a vision board for the whole town. To make one, everyone in the community, from residents to business owners to politicians to environmentalists, comes together to create a collage out of cut-up magazines or rather a collaborative list of goals and action items that are preferable for everyone. But if I'm not feeling super crafty that day, I could also use another tried and true approach, copying off my friends. Of course, we here at Study Hall don't condone plagiarism, not to mention that every community has its own specific goals and needs. So if I really just stole another town's ideas, it might not do much for sustainability except create a political scandal and harm my chances of reelection. But I can get inspired by looking at what's worked well for other communities, like Bend, Oregon. In 2005, the city council decided they needed a strategy for creating the best possible future as the city grew. They came up with a 20-page document that laid out their strategy through 2030, and it was slightly less attractive, but much more informative and specific than a community collage. It prioritized six specific dimensions to meet Ben's needs, focusing on city planning, economic health, the environment, public health, community building, and education. This led to significant changes in Ben, including opening a college campus and developing a public transit system. And it was so successful that the city wanted to do it again. This time, they put together a task force and spent 15 months meeting with thousands of community members and researching global trends like climate change, national trends like urbanization, and local trends like Ben's economic transition from tourism and timber to healthcare and tech startups. They interviewed leaders, put out bilingual surveys online, and conducted focus groups to ask about challenges Ben needed to overcome and changes that could improve the community. I guess you could say, they came together to discuss what was coming around the bend. They launched their new plan in 2022. It has many of the same goals as the original and includes initiatives to expand access to childcare, create financial assistance programs, expand public transit and bikeways, support mental health programs in schools, implement more solar energy, and increase tree cover. Ben's community vision process also incorporated another great strategy for building futures, known as backcasting. That's the process of envisioning a future and working backwards to identify the steps and actions to make it happen. In Ben's case, all those questions they ask community members help shape the goals of the vision plan and allow the city to develop specific actions to support them. In Sustainability's case, I made a promise to create a 20-mile trail for walkers, runners, and bikers. The first step is to work backward and determine the actions needed to make this vision a reality. Like completing a trail will require a successful construction process, which requires a plan supported by sufficient funds. But that can't happen without getting approval from local landowners, who will probably want to see the trail system mapped out to make an informed decision about it. And if I do all that, I'll be well on my way to becoming the most beloved mayor in history. I mean, creating a more sustainable sustainability. Of course, all that envisioning and planning is up to me and the rest of Sustainability's leaders. Not everyone has the power of a newly elected mayor hellbent on changing the world for the better. But there are things you, the people of Sustainability City, can do too. Things like letting us know what kinds of changes you want to see and making changes in your own lives to support that work. When we all work together, we'll be able to envision and create a more sustainable future, one that makes us less anxious and more hopeful, that looks less like an Elon Musk run dystopia, and more like a world where access to clean air, water, and energy, and multi-use trails are available to everyone. A future where I keep my campaign promise and become the best mayor sustainability no the whole country, no the entire world has ever seen. The future starts now, as soon as the celebratory plant-based cocktail wieners are gone. If you're enjoying the series and are interested in taking the full study hall sustainability course and earning college credit from ASU, check out gostudyhall.com or click on the button to learn more. And if you want to help us out, give this video a like, comment what you would do as mayor of sustainability, and smash that subscribe button. Thanks for watching, see you next time.